Good morning. Welcome to MRCC. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, I am not a dad, but all of the youth kids, they, they come up with different nicknames for me. I have leaders laughing because they're like, oh, there's like seven of them and he's got to pick the right one. Uh, all the youth kids, they call me Papa T. So I'm basically... Papa T honorary. You're it's honorary. like Father's Day for me. Yep. Papa T. Oh, man. Good luck with that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. There's worse ones. I'm not going to lie. So, uh, man. Well, good morning again. My name is Tyler. I'm the youth pastor here at MRCC. And I am Brent. I am our online campus and media pastor. You know, so that, that last song. It's another new hit. <laughs> yeah, for you. Yeah. No, it just brings me back. I remember doing like Sunday school and we had hand motions. Uh, Allison wanted me to show the hand motions and I said no. Um, but I just remember like the overhead projector. Does anyone else remember the overhead projector Sunday school? Yeah, I was the person that like would mess up and put it up like backwards, and so it was impossible to read. Yeah, there was that too. There was Thank a lot shadow of shadow hands. Yes, yes. Again, good morning. Uh, we're just here to give a few quick announcements. First off, it uh, camp signups for kids camp specifically today is the last day. I'm going to tell you one more time. Today is the last day to register for camp. So these camps, you have to register in two different places. And one of those places, once the deadline is gone, it is gone and your kids can't go to camp until next year. And that is sad because we want your kids to go to camp. So the last day for kids camp is today and we want to get your students signed up. Also, youth summer camp is coming up in, I think, 32 days. And so we are so excited for that. I'm more excited for that than kids camp because I get to go over and hang out with all of your youth students. And it's just an amazing time. I don't know when that registration ends. If I, if I'm. You should, that's, that's probably something. Yeah, it's like July have. 11th, I think. So we have some oh, we got time. time. Yeah, we have some time. But uh, we, we want your students to go to camp. So sign your students up for camp. Yep, absolutely. And uh, some of you may know uh, we had a memorial a little while ago for Bob Meeks, who was a beloved member, one of us in the church, his wife, Sheila. Uh, they've got uh, some farmland and they, we've just organized a, a work day to sort of help Sheila out with some stuff around the farm. That's going to be happening this Thursday at 9 a.m. This is just a fantastic opportunity for us to come together, to be the body of Christ, to be a family, to love on, on those of us who need something. This is something we see the early church do so much of in Acts and in other places. So this is an opportunity. If you're free Thursday uh, from starting at 9 a.m. to whenever work will, will be getting done, we would love to have you out there. Lunch will be provided. Provided. And if you're uh, going to be free, go ahead and chat with Pastor Dave, or you can call the church office and let us know. We'd love to have you help out there. The, the 27th. 27th. Oh, it's not this Thursday? Miscommunication. The 27th. Mark that on your calendars. The 27th. I blame Dave for that one. Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. We're off the hook. Oh, man. Also, uh, we're always on the hook. Yeah, Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. Ask, uh, ask Pastor Greg. The youth pastor gets blamed for everything, right? Yeah. So, yeah. True. Oh, man. Anyway, uh, this week, our summer calendar kind of kicks off. And with that, uh, Impact and Forged specifically, which is our, oh, shoot, kindergarten? Third, third, no, it, there's more. Anyway, I think it's, I'm pretty, I should know this stuff. It's first through fifth grade, at least. I know that for sure. First through fifth grade, um, it is their last Wednesday this night for the summer. There may be some hangouts, but specifically, for them, this is the last one, and it is their favorite one. It is the food fight, and so... Oh, if the kid's you, favorite and the parent's least favorite. Yeah, if you know, you know. If you don't, you should come and hang out, but uh, it starts... Uh, summer calendar starts. Youth specifically is going to go through the end of July, uh, but Impact and Forge, which is our kids, uh, ends this Wednesday, and so uh, have your kids come because it's disgustingly amazing. Disgustingly amazing is the perfect way uh, yeah, exactly. to describe it, 100%. Uh, if you are new or you're joining us for the first time or it's your first couple of Sundays, we would love to invite you. You can scan that QR code on the seat back in front of you. Uh, fill that out. And that's just a fantastic way to get plugged in, get to know more about what events we have coming up. Summer kind of has a chill vibe to it, but there's always something going on, a ton of events happening. So if you want to stay in the know, uh, go ahead and scan that QR code. We're not going to email you spam or we're going to show up at your door or nothing like that. We just want to give you the opportunity to kind of get connected with us and get to know that. And dads, it is Father's Day. You may have seen the trappings that we have around here. There will be meat. The meat will flow. Um, we promise you that. That will be coming later. But for now, uh, dads, we have a little something special for you. Would you turn your attentions to the screen? 
This is totally my happy place. Wait, this is your happy place? Oh, yep. I thought you said the uh, candy shop was your happy place. It is. So is the park swings and the petting zoo and watching you mow the lawn. <laughs> is that so? Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about walking the dog? Yep. Okay, uh, the backyard? Yep. <laughs> the cupcake shop? Yep. Uh, no. No, put it back. Put it back, not till we get home. Okay, what about, um... Oh, okay, hold on. Reel it in. Happy it. place. <laughs> Happy place. Happy place. Dad, wake up. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. Happy place. <laughs> Happy place. All right, kiddo, tell me this. How can all these places be your happy place? Dad, anywhere that you are is my happy place. Back. Now put your seatbelt on. Yeah, that's one of those ah uh, Father's Day videos. But fellas, uh, today's the day we do want to take a moment just to honor you because you know God chooses to use you in profound ways. So, fellas, fathers, would you stand up just so we can appreciate you this morning? Come on, somebody's got to go first. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's real. That's real. I trust that um, I trust that you're going to get spoiled today. That you're going to get taken care of today. My son goes over the top sometimes. So we did our Father's Day yesterday because Sunday's a pretty crazy busy day. And so uh, he and his wife came over and they brought me like two hundred dollars worth of Blue Max meats. I've got every kind of pepperoni flavor under the sun, every kind of jerky, every kind of summer sausage. I told him if I eat this. My arteries will clog, and I will die before I'm done with all of this stuff. But uh, I hope that, uh, that your son's daughter's family are, are, are going to honor you as well. You know, I, I got up this morning, and I was praying. And my heart on this Father's Day went to friends of mine who are dads that I know who have lost kids. Wow. That puts a little different angle on Father's Day. And my heart went to uh, friends that I know whose sons and daughters are, are under immense trials, enormous trials, everything from homelessness to illness, wrestling with marriage problems. And, and in all of that, I was thinking, wow, Lord, that's not the first thing I want to feel or think on Father's Day. But then the Lord showed me why he brought that to my heart. He said, Greg, I want you to know, and I want all fathers to know, that I have promised at the end of your journey as a dad to wipe away all your tears. I have promised, dad, that your tears will be wiped away. You say, how? I can't imagine how. I don't know how. But the one who promises has done things I thought were impossible. He's healed. He's raised the dead. He's defeated the enemy in the spirit. So the one who makes the promise to wipe away your tears can do it. And he says he will. So this morning, would you just pray with me for those dads for whom Father's Day is a challenge? And if you're one of those dads, know this. God, by his spirit, says to you today that your tears will be wiped away in the end. You will rejoice in the end. Don't know how, but I know it will be that way. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning, and I, I'm thinking, we are thinking of dads that we know who, who grieve today, Lord. Dads that we know who are hurting today, Lord, who, who are disconnected today and who have regrets today. And Lord, we pray that you would help each one of them hear your promise. 
that for us who believe at the end of the day, you will wipe away our tears. God, God we, we struggle to imagine how that can be. But you do far more than we can imagine. That's what your word tells us. And, and that promise is sure and certain. So Lord, we lift those dads to you. We lift those fathers to you. And we pray that you would remind them of your promise to wipe away the tears at the end. God, thank you for that promise. Thank you for giving us that to look forward to. We lift them to you today and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I hope you got great plans for today, this afternoon, to uh, to get together. And this morning, we are going to uh, finish our series called Hey Jude. Uh, third week, uh, we're in Jude, only one chapter. We're in the last part of Jude from verses 17 down through the end there. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn there. Did anybody else go down memory lane on that fourth song during worship this morning? Yeah, it takes back a few years. Some of us, it does. Jude chapter 1, beginning uh, with verse 17. Let's open God's word together. And let me begin by asking you this. Have you ever really aimed high at something and then fallen way short of what you were aiming for? You know, maybe you set out to make a big splash at work or on a holiday or in some vacation experience. And then for whatever reason, you know, it, it just went exactly the opposite. It turned out exactly the opposite. I, uh, I remember when Ron and I were first married, we'd only been married a couple of weeks. And um, I knew that she was sick and she was in the bedroom. And uh, so we were in our little apartment down there in Southern California. The phone rang and I was in the bathroom. And I thought to myself, a good husband would just suspend operations here and run out and answer that phone so she doesn't have to. These were the days when you didn't have a phone in your hand. It was on the wall, if you remember that. And, and so I immediately jumped up to go and answer that phone. But when I jumped up, my pants got caught around my ankles and I crashed face down with my bare bottom sticking up in the air just as my wife was coming out of the bathroom to answer the phone. And uh, I didn't succeed in helping her, but I did succeed in making her laugh uncontrollably to this day about that moment. Um, you know, you, sometimes we aim really high and we fall really short. A couple of years ago, you will remember, church, that you graciously sent me on my first and only sabbatical. And I had high hopes and big dreams. Do you remember this? Uh, my plan for the sabbatical was to ride my bike all the way from Seattle to San Diego down the coast highway, camp that way, and kind of go into the wilderness and be with the Lord. And then reality came crashing in, and I failed at it because my body wasn't up to that challenge. That's when I discovered that I was in my late 50s, not my mid-30s. <laughs> And uh, I remember the crushing weight of feeling like I had failed. And, and in, in that journey on that sabbatical, I remember learning that part of the reason I failed was that I didn't prepare adequately, right? Because I thought of myself, hey, I've always been able to do stuff like this my whole life. And I didn't take into account the need to train and prepare as we get older. And when I came back, I didn't come back the way I planned to come back. The Bible says Jesus went into the desert, came back in the power of the Spirit. Uh, I went on my sabbatical and came back with a mustache, which was a completely different thing, right? It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't nearly what I was hoping for. Um, but here's the thing. I did prepare for that. I took time <laughs> during the sabbatical, gave myself time to grow that before I showed back up among you. And here's the thing, a little late back there, audio-visual people, but thanks for catching up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, here's the thing I learned, is that I didn't really need to do something awesome and amazing in order to experience what God wanted for the sabbatical. What he wanted was to, for me to be alone with him in a protracted way, in a long period of time so that he could talk to me about things that maybe I would struggle to hear in a short period of time or in the middle of all the busyness of life. And that all he was really calling me to was not to conquer the West Coast on my bicycle. That was me. But to come aside and be alone with him for a season. And in that time, he spoke to me in, in ways that still echo in my heart. 
And the real lesson the Lord taught me on that sabbatical was that, you know, I don't have to prove something just to be with him. That being with him is enough. And if we simply make, here's the thing, church. If we simply make space and time to be with him in our lives, he will transform us. Receive that this morning. Because some of us are feeling like, Lord, I want to be transformed in ways in my life that maybe I've sought for a long time, but it's, it's not happening. And, and we think to ourselves that we have to produce this transformation. When the Bible says that we are transformed simply, catch this church, simply by being with him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 puts it this way. We who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In other words, as we gaze upon him, as we are simply with him, as we contemplate what he says, what he does, who he is, that's all that's required for our transformation. The scripture says the transformation comes from the Lord. All we have to do is be willing to behold him, to contemplate him, to reflect upon him. The Hebrew, uh, Greek word there is very interesting. It has the whole idea of thinking and feeling and remembering and reflecting, contemplating. That's the idea. And it's that that Jude has in mind as he finishes his letter to the church. Remember at the beginning, he says, I wanted to talk to you about the joy of your salvation, but I had to warn you about some real stuff. We said he's, he's speaking kind of like a, a parent who is sending a teenage driver out for the first time on their own. Hey, I want you to enjoy this, but there's some things you need to be aware of that are necessary to your enjoyment. And so he, he talks about false teachers and all that. Then in the end, he takes a different tack and he speaks to something very specific in each of our lives. And that is that transformation and how it happens. So let's, let's pick up at verse 17 of Jude, chapter one, only one chapter. Here's what Jude writes. He says, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and don't have the spirit. So his theme all the way through has been to watch out for these false teachers, these false prophets. Same spirit that Jesus expressed in Matthew 7 when he says to us, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They're actually dangerous wolves. He says, you want to keep an eye out for these guys. Again, like a parent saying, drive defensively, drive safely, have your head up, pay attention because there's a lot of false prophets speaking in the name of Jesus. We've been hearing Jude talk about that. Now he talks about, at the end, the scoffers. And this is really important. Notice what he says. First of all, he says, dear friends, anyone who shares our faith church is a friend, even if they disagree on lesser things. Can I invite you to own that for a moment? The Bible tells us that there's such thing as disputable matters, lesser matters on which believers disagree with. We need to make space in our faith and in our understanding of each other as believers to recognize that on a lot of lesser things, believers can disagree. It doesn't make us any less one. It doesn't make us any less family. It doesn't make us any less friends. One of the most important things we can do is separate the disputable matters in the world from the essential matters. Romans 14 goes at length to describe that and Jude, recognizing that, calls those who maybe don't agree with him on everything to still recognize their friendship. He says, dear friends, remember, remember what the apostles foretold. Remember so that, and here's the reason, and this is a word for our time. He says, remember so that you won't be surprised and discouraged by scoffers. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people nowadays, seems like more in the last five, six, seven years, who say to me, I'm so discouraged by the world. I mean, it's just awful. I want out of here. Where's the exit? You know, where's the checkout point? I'm done. And that happens to us when we're surprised by the reality of the struggles of the world around us. The scoffers, the people who, who dismiss our faith, or more importantly, dismiss the values of our faith. So this includes the false teachers as well. Sometimes we get discouraged by all that. And Jude says, don't. Remember, we told you this was going to happen. Jesus told you this was going to happen. 
You know, sometimes I feel that myself, right? I get up and I look at the world and go, are you kidding? Another war? <laughs> are you kidding? More nonsense? Are you kidding? Another shooting at a splash park in you know, Ohio? I mean, really? But when we recognize that Jesus and the apostles told us this was going to happen already and we're unsurprised by it, it feels different. We shouldn't get surprised. You know, as I'm in my 60s now, there's all these new aches and pains that I didn't used to happen. And another reality that's kind of entered Rhonda and I live, our lives is that we order cheater glasses now in bulk. We order a box full of them, right? <laughs> So that you have a pair in each bathroom, you have a pair in the living room, you have a pair in the kitchen, you have a pair on the bed stand in the bedroom, you have a pair in the car, and then you have a pair that hangs from your collar all the time. Because it used to be simple to just pick stuff up and read it, but you can't do that anymore. Wendy said to me this week, hey, is the font larger on your sermon text? Yes, yeah, shut up. Don't notice that, all right? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. And, and there's a part of me, there's a part of you and us that wants to kind of get discouraged by that. But wait a minute, the Lord said this was all going to come. The Lord said this was all going to happen. Uh, he said in the last days there will be scoffers. He says, I want you to remember not to be surprised and therefore discouraged by it. There will always be scoffers who say silly things like there's no God or that we were seated here by aliens or that the earth is flat or airplane contrails or a government conspiracy or fill in the blank. There will always be that nonsense. Jude says, don't get discouraged by it. Remember, we told you that was going to happen. Ignore it. And he talks about the scoffers in a specific way. He says, scoffers always have an agenda of their own. They're self-centered. They're always focused on their own desires. When we see that, we can be tempted to be discouraged. But God says, don't be. Instead, Greg, remember that what I've called you to do is to want my way more than your way. Church, this is a big deal. <laughs> you will grow up in your faith and find increasing peace, confidence, invulnerability to the world around you when you increasingly say, Lord, I want your way in my life. Uh, Lord, I surrender my way because I want your way. I know it's better. I know it's better for me. I know it's better for those around me. I know it's better for my time and place in the world. God, I want your way instead of mine. In the Lord's Prayer, which Jesus taught us to practice, the part where we say, your kingdom come, your will be done, that's not a plea to win an election. That's a plea for God to rule me in my life, in my heart, in my daily living. And when we aim for that, when we choose to desire that, then we find a peace that passes understanding. And that's what Jude is calling us to remember. Garrison Keeler, if you're familiar with him, tells about a small town in Minnesota, speaking of people who have their own agenda. A small town in Minnesota that was inspired by a, a new resident to form a living flag celebration on the 4th of July. What did that look like? Well, the whole town got together. They issued red, white, and blue caps. And then everybody made a big mob in the park so that it made a giant U.S. flag. And you could climb up on top of City Hall and look down at the living flag. All these people there with red, white, and blue hats in the shape of the flag. And you know, he talks about what a cool event it was, and everybody got to go up and see it. One little old lady till the end said, oh, I don't need to go to see it. She said, no, get up there and look at it, Mary. You're going to go see the flag. We all put up with this. It was sort of becoming a sitting and leaning flag at this point. And then at the end, he talks about the fact that this whole idea for a living flag celebration on the 4th of July turns out to have been the plan of a hat salesman. <laughs> all right? He was the guy who proposed it. And there will be those who are pursuing their own agendas, but we find a place beyond discouragement when we say, God, I want your agenda. Lord, I want your way in my life, in my day, each day at a time. He said these scoffers will divide you by following mere natural instincts. This is intense. What does he mean by that? Well, there is an assumption that some make that following Jesus doesn't require me to be contrary to my own impulses and desires, when in fact it does. Jesus says, if anybody wants to come after me, take up your cross daily and follow me. Let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, writes specifically to, 
writes specifically to believers who had been wronged by other believers. And he says to them this. He says, it's better for you to be wronged than to go to court. It's better for you to be cheated than to go to law against your brother. That's intense. A lot of us tend to say, well, you know, I'm just not going to do that. Okay. But God calls us to that kind of thing. Now, it's not a carte blanche cover for every situation, but the attitude that says, I'm more concerned about the bigger picture than the smaller picture. I'm more concerned about the witness of my life or of God's church than I am about my own rights or prerogatives or even financial well-being. That is the heart of a believer. That is a heart led by the Holy Spirit. Stop and think about it, friends. Jesus surrendered all his prerogatives and rights. He went to the cross for us. And he didn't do it grudgingly, and he didn't do it because he was forced to. He did it because he chose to. The opposite is to follow mere natural instincts. Let me challenge you. When was the last time you allowed your well-being to be sacrificed for the cause of the gospel? For the cause of Christ in your life, your witness. Or how about this? When was the last time you allowed your own well-being to be sacrificed for the health of your church, his bride, the body of Christ? Paul writing to the Corinthians says, hey, at the end of the day, you'll be more glad you did that than if you looked out for yourself. Whereas the scoffers, they just follow their natural instincts. They're wrong, they're going to wrong back. They're hit, they're going to hit back. But we're different. Can I share with you a personal story? Many years ago when I was a youth pastor, our senior pastor went into moral failure. I came back from a missions trip to find that this had all been exposed. Massive church split. The whole board resigned. It was a big disaster. Uh, catastrophic damage to the church. And in the wake of that, I had no idea about this, but I was the youth pastor and they asked me, Pastor Greg, would you lead us while we go through this process of finding a new pastor? So absolutely I did. And just a couple of weeks later, some men from our church board, a new interim board that had been put together during this awful season, they came to me and they said, Pastor, we've contracted a lawyer. We're going to sue the former pastor. And I said, oh, brothers, we can't do that. But he did wrong. Yes, he did. But the Bible says that the cause of Christ is served more fully by our being cheated than by our going to law against him. They said, well, pastor, we feel like we want to do this. I said, okay, you can do that. I mean, yes, you're right. But if you do, I will resign. I will step down because I can't be part of that because the Bible teaches me that even when I've been wronged, sometimes it's better to let myself be wronged for the cause of the gospel than otherwise. And, and I remember two of these brothers said to me, Pastor Greg, I know it says that in the Bible, but the Bible's an old book. We can't do anything by the Bible. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding? What? You know, that was another one of those moments when I realized that growing old is mandatory, but growing up is optional, all right? I said, what do you mean it's an old book? What are you talking about? It's the word of God, right? But let me challenge us. Jude challenges us. Hey, realize that those following mere natural instincts, those scoffers, they're always going to be there, but don't be discouraged by it. Can I just challenge you as your fellow believer right now this morning? Are you letting yourself be discouraged by what's going on in the world? Don't be. Jude says, Jesus told you this was going to happen. Wars, rumors of wars, false prophets, lies, all that nonsense was going to happen, but he's got it under control. At the end of the day, he'll have the last word. You know, here's the reality is that some folks are, care more about their own individual situation than they care about God's church as a whole. And I'm not just talking about MRCC. I'm talking about God's church everywhere. They don't think in terms of God's word and the mission of the gospel or of the body of Christ. They only think about the Constitution or their own business plans or their own comfort and security or maybe just their own feelings. But Jude says, watch out for those guys. They will divide you. Because they're not following the Spirit. Paul actually exhorts us to take strong action when we encounter this kind of thing. Here's what he tells Titus over in chapter 3. He says, warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. A divisive person, a person who's not about the whole, not about the, the body of Christ as a whole. He says, after that, just have nothing to do with them. Doesn't mean you hate them, doesn't mean you attack them. You just back off, give them space, let them be. 
you may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful, he's self-condemned. Church, there's never going to be any escaping for you and I from the fundamental call of Jesus, which is to take up your cross daily, deny yourself, and follow him. But that's actually where the joy is found, in knowing that we're living for something so significant that we're willing to do that. Sometimes the big picture matters infinitely more than our little pictures. And the sooner we grab a hold of that, the sooner we escape the discouragement that comes from the scoffer. But that's not all he says. He moves on because you know what they say, the best defense is a good offense. So he calls us not just to kind of play defense, but to play offense on this issue. Look at verse 20. But you, dear friends, contrary to being discouraged by the scoffers, but you, dear friends, check this, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. And pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you fully into eternal life. In other words, don't just play defense, play offense. There's a difference between just trying to avoid making mistakes and aiming for success. It's when we play offense that we find the fullness of freedom. Aim for what's good, and that's half the battle as far as evading what isn't. To build yourself up in your most holy faith means, catch this, friends, to make it your ambition to be a God-pleaser instead of a self-pleaser or a crowd-pleaser. To say, God, what I want my life to be about is pleasing you. Sometimes we say, we kind of fall into this mode where we just say, God, help me not make any mistakes. (laughs) But the problem with just not making any mistakes is that you never have any successes. He says, Jude says, play for successes. Do you remember the parable of the talents that Jesus told there in Matthew chapter 25? A master goes on a journey, gives three different servants talents, part of his financial portfolio, and he says, invest this. And, you know, the first guy takes it and he achieves a certain amount of success. He invests and makes more money for the master. The second one does the same thing. And then the third guy, the third guy, Jesus says, he was afraid And so he took the talent he was entrusted with. He buried it in a hole so he wouldn't lose it. And when he came back, when the master came back and found this out, he calls him a wicked servant. Why? Because he wasn't trying to succeed. He was just trying not to fail. And he was just trying not to fail because as the the servant himself says, I knew you were a hard man. Some people are living like that. They're just saying, you know what? I don't want to make any mistakes. I just want to get through my life without smoking, drinking, or chewing, or going with girls who do, right? I'm just going to do that. God says, are you kidding? Are you kidding? I've given you talents to invest in seeking and saving the lost along with me. He says, no, I don't want you to just avoid the bad. In fact, more than that, I'm calling you to seek the good. We build ourselves up in our faith, as Jude says, when we ask questions and seek answers and when we invest our gifts in God's mission. And church, if you didn't know, here's here's a heads up. God deeply loves our questions. He loves your questions. When you read his word and say, wait a minute, it says this, but it says this. How does that go together? He thrills to that because it's in the learning and the growing that we discover more of who he is and that we are transformed. We are made to seek to grow, not merely to avoid trying to get caught up in bad stuff. You know, on the night that the Titanic sank, you may know this, nearly 2,500 people went into the water. But what you might not know is this, that there were two large passenger ships who saw the flares, the distress flares that she shot into the night sky. One of them was the USS California, and another one was the USS Carpathia. The bridge crew on the California, seeing those flares shot into the night, they were only 20 miles away. But when they saw the flares, they chatted about them, looked at them, but left their radio off and said, well, that's their business, and we don't want to disturb any of our passengers, so... We'll just sail on safely through these iceberg waters and not paying attention to what's going on there. They're probably just having a party. And as a consequence, only 20 miles away, they sailed away from the need. By contrast, on the bridge of the USS Carpathia, 53 miles away, they saw the rocket flares go into the sky and said, that can't be good. 
And they immediately got on the radio and radioed the Titanic. The Titanic said, yes, we're sinking. Please come. And as a consequence, they came and spent the next three and a half hours saving 705 people. All for one reason. They weren't just not trying to do bad. They were trying to do good. One crew was trying. One was just coasting. And, and church, to circle back to where we started, this trying, this building ourselves up in our faith that Jude is talking about, it really has two simple parts. The first is the Bible says we are transformed as we contemplate Jesus. Listen, listen to it again. And we who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. In other words, as we just behold him, think about him, reflect on him, watch what he does, Listen to what he says. As we just allow that to become a regular part of our lives, it on its own power brings transformation into our lives. You know, when I try to relate to this, I remember when I was a young man in the military and before I got to the ER, I worked in the alcohol rehab ward, the inpatient substance abuse ward. And there was a counselor who worked on that ward. His name was Dick, much older man, had spent a lifetime working with addiction and substance abuse. And sometimes I would watch him interacting with patients and he had this most tender, gentle, compassionate way of relating to these guys and gals who were struggling with addiction. It was unfailing. You, you would never see anything else because it was who he was. And I remember watching him and thinking, I want to be like that. And I remember watching him and, and intentionally modulating my voice to be like his voice. I remember watching him and then intentionally learning how he made eye contact and how he would sometimes touch his patient on the shoulder and all of this kind of stuff. And as I just watched Dick go through the day, I started to do the same thing. It's amazing transformation, which I'm thankful for because then it later on when God called me to the ministry, that was a good thing to have learned. In the same way as we just behold Jesus, we are changed. You don't have to summon up the energy. You don't have to grit your teeth and make it happen. It just happens as we contemplate the Lord's glory. And then here's the other part of it. Jude says in verse 21, catch this. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. What does he mean by that? He means that we should dwell on and be mindful of and remember God's love for us. And, and this is so simple. Do you remember when you first met Jesus? Do you remember what you felt, what you appreciated? Do you remember what you perceived about him and how he captured your heart and your mind? He hasn't changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sometimes we think that as we change, he changes. But he's exactly the same as he was when you first met him. If you go back to that moment when you first believed, Jesus is exactly the same. And as we remember that, as we sometimes rediscover that, what happens is that keeps us in God's love. And when we live in that place, again, we are transformed. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then finally, Jude swings into the home stretch in our last few minutes this morning. He says, verses 22 and 23, catch this. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. And to others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Okay, what does that mean? Let's close with this. First of all, be merciful to those who doubt. Oh, friends, please hear me. First service, some of you have been with me a long time. Hear me on this. God's church is meant to be a place where doubters can have time and space to walk out their journey to faith. Sometimes those of us who are older become critics because we forgot that we were once younger, because we forgot to leave space for those who haven't had time yet to learn what we have learned. Nobody should be more filled with grace and patience for other believers than those of us who've grown gray hair because we know how long it took us to learn. Don't let yourself forget that you were young once. Don't let yourself forget that all the things you know now, you had to learn. And we are mature believers when we create a safe space and give others the time to grow up in their faith. 
into the places that we've been privileged to grow to. Let me ask you this question. Are you merciful to those who don't believe yet? Are you merciful with those who haven't yet learned what you've learned? That's what it means. That's what Jude is talking about. And then he goes on to say, snatch others from the fire and save them. That means we tell the truth both boldly and compassionately. Boy, if there was ever a word for our time, it's this one. First Peter chapter one or chapter three says this. Always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Is your social media gentle and respectful? Is it patient? Is it kind and hopeful? Is your conversation respectful and gentle? Sometimes it just pierces my heart when I hear a believer who should know better. Talk about those who haven't found faith yet disrespectfully or angrily. Jesus has given us a much better example. Yes, the truth must be spoken. Absolutely, but we do it with gentleness and respect. Whenever I read this verse, I remember a day in the ER when we had a little boy about 10 years old who had been in a car wreck and he dislocated his shoulder. And you could see it. It was all out of whack. And I remember the doctor who came in and I was assisting him. And he says to this little boy and to his parents, I got to put it back. This is really going to hurt, but I got to put it back. The best thing I could possibly do for you is to put it back. He's, and I'll always remember that little 10-year-old boy, okay, you know, he's like, like this. And then the doctor wrenched that thing in, and that little guy screamed like a girl, and he was not embarrassed. Where to be like that when we're talking to those who are dislocated, who are out of the place that God would have for them? Be compassionate in those ways. And then finally, he says this, show mercy mixed with fear. That means that we don't help others struggling with sin by joining with them in it. You know, the first thing you teach a rescue swimmer is that when somebody is drowning and you're going to rescue them, you approach them from behind. You don't approach them from the front because they'll grab you and drag you down as well. So you approach them carefully in an effort to save them from uh, a safe place. I love what C.S. Lewis says about this. He says, we are absolutely called by God to hate sin. But we are called to hate the sins of others the same way we hate sin in ourself. Well, how do we hate sin in ourself? We want it to be gone, but we want the self to make it. We want the self to be saved. We're hopeful and patient with ourselves as we wrestle with our own sin. Jude is talking about being that way with those around us. The big idea in all of this, though, is that we are called to be like rescue swimmers and that that happens as we prepare ourselves, how do we prepare ourselves? Merely to gaze on the Lord, merely to reflect on him and be transformed by that reflecting. Do you have a, a little moment every day when you just say, Jesus, I want to think about you. I want to reflect on what you do, what you say, who you are. It's going to take a little time to do that. The Bible says we do that. We are transformed. Let me finish with the story. On the 19th of June in 2021, a distress call was sent by the sailboat Barlavento, which was 80 miles off the coast of California. The distress signal was picked up by the Coast Guard. That's what the Coast Guard does. And there were six passengers on the boat, several injured. And the storm that was going on at the time was a big one. 60 mile power winds had capsized the boat, raised 20 foot swells in the sea, 49 degree water. The U.S. Coast Guard rescue swimmer on duty that day in that portion of the California coast was a young man by the name of Spencer Manson. In fact, this was his very first day on duty. <laughs> he, this was his first day on duty as a rescue swimmer. Now, let me pause for a moment. Because some people think that the toughest training in the U.S. military is the SEALs or the Delta Force or the Marine Corps Force Recon or something like that. They're absolutely wrong. The highest washout rate for any special service training program in the military is the aviation survival technician course that Coast Guard rescue swimmers undergo. 85% of the people who sign up for it can't make it. They wash out. It's 24 weeks of grueling water survival and swim rescue training. 
Well, it was Spencer Manson's first day on the job, but he'd been through that preparation. And so even though it was his first day, he jumped on the chopper, they hauled him out to the boat. He went into the water without hesitation, and over the next 40 minutes, he saved all six people and was awarded the U.S. Navy Distinguished Flying Cross for his heroism. And when he was asked afterwards how he could do that his first time out, he said, I had 24 weeks of preparation. <laughs> all that preparation made me ready for this moment, and all that preparation was worth it. In the same way, God says that we are transformed as we contemplate Jesus, and that that makes us able to be who he calls us to be, and that's where our joy is found. So let me just ask you this morning, are you building yourself up in your faith, or are you just trying not to do wrong? The Lord says there's more joy in building yourselves up in your faith. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? Lord, we hear your word this morning, and, and we are surrounded by so many distractions, so many other things that want to take up all our time and attention. But you invite us every day to contemplate you, to reflect on you. And then you promise us that if we just do that, we will be transformed. God, give us eyes to see the drowning people all around us, that we might be willing to be built up in our faith for their sake. Open our eyes. God, let us be like the ship that said, oh, there's trouble. I want to be a rescuer. God, help us to have that heart and that spirit in our world, not to be discouraged, but instead, Lord, to be challenged, to join you in your great mission to seek and save the lost. We pray for that. Speak to our hearts as we go today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Happy Father's Day again, fellas. As you go out today, we have got both sugar and salt for you. We've got donuts. We've got meat products. Take advantage. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them. Have a happy Father's Day.